I'm so delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Lily Cho. Good evening, everyone. I am the Associate Dean for Global and Community Engagement here at the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. And on behalf of our faculty, our 650 faculty members and 23,000 students, I would like to welcome you to Shelter in Place, a conversation on community, connection, and refuge. Our second Dell and Bonita Smith lecture in peace, justice, and human security. Before we go further, I want to acknowledge the land we are on today. York University recognizes that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been taken care by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confe uh, Nation, sorry, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, I'm sorry, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. For those of you joining virtually tonight, and I know there are hundreds of you out there, I encourage you to also consider the spaces and the indigenous lands upon which you are joining us today. Thank you so much. I am incredibly excited to host and moderate this event for over 500 of us gathered together in person and virtually tonight. To help us meet the needs of all of our participants, we have arranged to have live and closed captioning for this panel. Virtual participants who would benefit from closed captioning are encouraged to bring their mouse to the bottom of the screen and select closed caption and then show subtitle. If you are having trouble with this, please use the raise hand function or feature, and we will assist you privately in Zoom chat. We have an amazing team tonight who are on deck for you. Once again, welcome everyone to tonight's event. We are very pleased to have on our panel today two award-winning authors York and, and a York alumni, Billy Ray Belcour and David Cheriandi, friends and wonderful human beings. I am deeply grateful to them for accepting this invitation and for supporting the work that we are doing here in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies at York University. And forgive me for following this script. We're on a tight timeline, so if I don't, we're gonna go way off. And I love ad-libbing, as you know, if you've been in my room, in my class. <laughs> so, okay, but before we do anything, it is my great pleasure, anything more, um, to welcome Dr. J.J. McMurtry, Dean of the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, who will bring greetings on behalf of the Dean's Office and tell, a little bit, uh, tell us a little bit about the Smith Dialogues. And I'm just going to hand it to you, J.J. Thank you, everybody, and good evening to you all. It really is a thrill to be here tonight with all of you in person and all of you out there in the electronic universe. Um, I don't know what to call it now anymore. So, um, but it, it's really wonderful that we're getting participation from our, obviously our local space, but from around the world as well. So as Lily said, I wanna talk a little bit about this lecture and how it's come to be. So the full name of this series is the Dell and Juanita Smith Lecture in Peace, Justice, and Human Security. As the name indicates, this annual event is dedicated to hosting interesting conversations, and I'm sure we're going to have one tonight, and exploring ideas that promote peace and justice widely understood in our culture and in our society. The Smith Dialogues cover very real and very challenging topics, but with the ultimate goal, we hope, of pointing us towards more human flourishing of the mind, the spirit, and the being. This series was created as a result of a generous bequest from the late Delmar and Juanita Smith. 
Professor Dell Smith was a political scientist who in 1963 became the inaugural dean of the Atkinson faculty at York University. In 2009, the Atkinson faculty and York's Faculty of Arts were brought together to create the faculty I currently lead, the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. Throughout the 1960s and the 1970s, under the leadership of Delmar Smith and others, the Atkinson faculty became a pioneer in offering flexible programming that enabled working people and non-traditional students to attain a university education. My own grandmother got a degree from Atkinson. The Atkinson faculty was doing this long before most other institutions had ever conceived of making university education available to mature or part-time students. And the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies has inherited that legacy and continues to promote access to education for a diversity of learners, and it will always be part of our DNA. Professor Dell Smith was a lifelong scholar remembered for his great mind and his generous spirit. This event bearing the names of Juanita and Dell Smith is quickly becoming a signature event in our faculty's annual calendar. The series is a most fitting tribute to the lives and memories of these outstanding people. So I wanna also take a moment to thank today's organizers and especially Professor Lily Cho, our Associate Dean Global and Community Engagement. It's a lot of work to put these events on and especially as we hopefully are emerging out of COVID into something else. And it's really an incredible effort. And I wanna thank Lily, but I also wanna thank the team who silently works behind the scenes and makes everything come together. I see a couple of you in the room, so thank you so much. And it's really also something else to say about organizing hybrid uh, events. I hope that people online are experiencing the, this well and clearly, but it's not an easy thing to do. And it's really quite an important thing to do in this day and age for us to be trying at York University and hopefully succeeding. So I wanna end by saying our panelists, Billy Ray Bellacourt and David Cheriandi are both enormously skilled and accomplished authors. Lily will give you a full introduction to each one of them in a moment, but I just wanna say thank you to both of you who I've known personally or talked to at least uh, for periods of time. And I'm super thrilled that you guys have come here today to share with us this evening. So again, welcome everybody to the 2022 Smith Dialogue. I know we will enjoy this conversation together and I wanna thank you all for being here virtually or in person. Thank you, JJ. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists. And what, no, what's gonna happen? I know, this is like a whole thing. We didn't have a dress rehearsal. Is I'm, um, you know what, you're right. You do come up, Billy Ray. If I could just invite Billy Ray up onto the stage. Um, yay! Yay! <laughs> so happy. Um, I, I'm going to read your bio. He doesn't need an introduction, but please let me do this anyway, because your achievements are so, are so incredible. Billy Ray Belcourt is from the Drift Pile Cree Nation in Northwest Alberta in Treaty 8 territory. He is an assistant professor in the School of Creative Writing at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. He is the author of four critically acclaimed books, This Wound is a World, Indian Coping Mechanisms, Notes from the Field, A History of My Brief Body, and A Minor Course, in 2018, he became the youngest recipient of the prestigious Griffin Poetry Prize. Welcome. And, sorry. I'm gonna say this like at many intervals, but all of Billy Ray's and David's books are available for purchase outside. And this is your chance to fangirl them afterwards for autographs. And we had a whole discussion at dinner about how fangirling is a feminist practice. So if you haven't already thought about doing it, I recommend it now. Um, okay, sorry, this is me ad living again. Sorry, okay, back on track. David, could I please invite you on stage? I won't fall. You know what, I'm gonna stand over here so I don't sh like shatter you. Okay, all right. David Cheriandi, welcome back to York University. Thank you for coming. He is the author of the novel Suciant and Brother, as well as the memoir I've been meaning to tell you, A Letter to My Daughter. He has won multiple awards, including the Rogers Writers' Press Prize, a fiction prize, sorry, the City of Toronto Prize, and the Wyndham Campbell Prize of Yale University for a body of fiction. A feature film adaptation of Brother premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2022. He is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada Division of Arts and 
York University alumnus. David teaches contemporary literature and specializes in Black, Caribbean, and Canadian fiction at Simon Fraser University. Welcome, Billy Ray. Welcome, David. Thank you. And welcome, all of you. Thank you. OK, we now begin dialoguing. And just so you all know, <laughs> we are going to talk. Uh, and for those of you uh, who are joining us virtually, we invite you to uh, submit questions at any point. We have some questions pre-submitted, which I also have. Uh, and then for those in the audience, you, you, we, we will invite questions um, after a period of the formal dialogue, OK? Uh, and I am going to switch my notes. Excuse me. I have all these different. OK, so what I wanted to start with was how, we st how, how you both ended up here. <laughs> uh, and that is when uh, we started to think about the Smith Dialogues for this year, you know, as, as many of you know, when you plan an event or you plan something, you, you, you do it months and months before the thing actually happens. And we've all been living through epochs of this pandemic and the chapters of it have been different and marked and changed. And when I was a few months ago trying to imagine what November or October would look like for us here, all I could think about was also what it would mean to consider bringing all of you here together and what it might mean to reemerge from the shelters that we've created, the refuges that we've been living through and creating for ourselves. And so one of the things that I've thought a lot about over the last three years, really, is first of all, how much I wanted to see you both again. <laughs> so this is selfish, but also about how the refuges, refuges and shelters that we create are also spaces that can alienate us uh, from the communities that we're in and the places where we might want to be. And I wondered if I could start by inviting you to sort of sit with that possible contradiction of of shelter and refuge as a site of solace, but also alienation. Um, and I'm just going to do that teacher thing where, Billy Ray, I invite you to sort of think first, if that's OK. <laughs> I don't think I'm on yet, but OK. Um, so the first thing that came to mind when thinking about that contradiction is loneliness, because loneliness has been a theme that's run throughout my books. So I'm interested not in just in the way that loneliness requires us to confront the, the fact that uh, we are alive and that being alive sometimes feels difficult, but also that it means that we are in concert with others who the world also estranges in some way. So I've been thinking with over the course of a few years, the work of the, the cultural and feminist theorist Anne Spekovich, who argues that, um, to, that we can share the feeling of being lonely and in so doing create these other kinds of communities and collectivities that make shared flourishing more possible. Mm. Because you know, loneliness, we can think of it as not an internal problem or an individual problem, but a larger social problem. The effect of having to live in a world that is built so as to um, enrich some people's lives and subjugate others. And so uh, I want my work in, if only it's, you know, tiny way to extend a kind of invitation to to share in the feeling of wanting another world. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I'm, I'm just allow me to fangirl for a moment. But thank you. I mean, I love the idea that we can be alone together in the worlds that we can create collectively through acts of reading, through acts of creation. Um, David, I wonder if you want to add to that or think wow, with me I'm, on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm sitting right now with what uh, Billy Ray just said, and I just think that that's uh, uh, that's resonating with me so much. Um, Honestly, when I heard about the theme for this, uh, this gathering, um, I, um, I guess I was tempted to, to question the possibility of refuge and that uh, so much of the work that I, I read and admire and perhaps some of the work that I write um, challenges the 
the illusions of refuge, yeah. refuge within nation states, uh, ref refuge within communities, uh, refuge even within uh, spaces. When we try, when we imagine that we've etched out um, against uh, power, against uh, the gaze, the negative gaze of others, we've etched out a, a place. Um, how secure are we actually in that space? And I think a lot of that thinking comes from an absorption, in my case, uh, uh, of the um, of legacies of black thought, where uh, in, in my interpretation, um, the strand that I'm, I'm just interested in follow, following, I guess, um, we, we do, we all want safety. We want, um, we want human connection. And yet, so often we are proffered illusions about these things, yeah. and um, and perhaps at times the work of the writer is to uh, puncture uh, those 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 balloons, uh, those bright balloons of uh, of refuge. As even as even as, and this is why your question resonates so strongly for me, um, even as. Uh, we gather and we uh, listen to one another and uh, you know one one kind of form of uh, gathering and listening I, I've just uh, finished uh, Billy Ray's uh, minor chorus and uh, among the many things that he does in that book that I just find so compelling um, there's an interesting dialogue between black and indigenous thought right, that runs throughout throughout that book um, but yeah, I guess um, how to how to at once feel that we we deserve safety. We deserve um, uh, um, forms of gathering that do not harm others, and at the same time not succumb to the illusion of of a space where we are um, we are safe. As as hard as it is to say that. Okay, I have a million strands, so I'm just going to mark them out. Uh, <laughs> because what you just said, David, I mean, there, there are a few things I want to follow up on and bring them to you, Billy Ray. But, you know, one of them, of course, is what's different. You know, I, I'm up here and I'm in this room with all of you, and I think a lot about how gathering like this has been so important in my intellectual life, in my intellectual development, to be in conversation with people I love and admire, um, but that the history, the recent history that we've lived through of mass illness has shown us that there's a potential danger always in the ways that we gather and the refuges that, refuges that we create for each other. And that has been, I think, something that I'm still grieving. Like, I'm still trying to understand the contradiction of those things. And I want, you know, I want to be with people. I want to be with you. But I also know that I'm asking you to take a kind of risk you know, to be here and to join me here. And that's something that I think a lot about. Um, but it, I, I, I'm going to bookmark the black thought in a minor course, which I've also been thinking about, and specifically Giovanni's room and how that works. We're going to come back to that. But David, you know what I want to do right now? <laughs> so I want to read you a passage from Indian Coping Mechanisms, sure. um, because I think it actually connects to something you're saying. Okay. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm just so happy I have this up my sleeve. <laughs> but um, so in Indian Coping Mechanisms, Billy Ray writes, and I you, you guys, I, you have to forgive me because I had to include the first two lines, which I love, but which are not connected to the idea of refuge exactly, <laughs> but I just love it. So just bear with me. I'm going to read the quote twice, okay? Um, so it goes, so Billy Ray writes, selfishly, I want a world where no one has abs. <laughs> Sorry, I, just, I love that line. I want a world where there are no ghosts in the machine of relationality. And then here's the, here's the part about refuge and intimacy. Intimacy will not be a trap door. A trap door will not be a refuge. A refuge will not be whatever dulls the feeling of aliveness. Aliveness will not be hope against all odds. Hmm. I'm going to read that again, Kay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to include the line about the abs because I also <laughs> want a world without abs. Selfishly, I want a world without abs. I know. It was such a good line. Do you remember writing it? I, was, I want a world where there are no ghosts in the machine of relationality. Intimacy will not be a trapdoor. A trapdoor will not be a refuge. A refuge will not be whatever dulls the feeling of aliveness. Aliveness will not be a hope 
will not be hope against all odds. That's a that's a such a powerful chain of uh, of um, what are those? They, you know, they're um, additions or modifications. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a that's a beautiful line. That's a really beautiful line. Can I tell the, you why I read it to you? Oh, sorry. Well, I was just saying the <laughs> the one thing, and it would be I I because I can't right now think of what happened before and after, which is so important to kind of when, when, when these lines are drawn out. But the sh isolated is such a beautiful line. But it's the, um, the question of ghosts. Um, I, I get what you're saying in that line, and I too share that feeling. I really do share that feeling. Um, but there's a, I wonder if there's also a kind of an, an ethics in our relationship to the dead and the ways that the dead speak and haunt, uh, speak to us and haunt us. And uh, I actually, I actually want a, a world in which there is greater attention to, to ghosts in a certain way and, and a greater acknowledgement of the dead and a greater ethical impulse to, in a way that Marlene Norbesi Philip says, subsequently quoted by Christina Sharp, defend the dead. And so there, I, I'm trying to, at the same time, I, I, do, I do get that, what's, what's how that anchors the phrase, I really do. But... Um, Thank you. Yeah, I think I'll stop I love talking that. now. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, but I was... But I, I mean it, yeah. Well, it's partly because part of what we were talking about was on the subway ride up was, you know, we, we start to share a sense of loss, um, you know, the, the losses that we've all experienced in the last few years and how it's been hard to understand how to find a space to recognize that in these moments of reopening, reentry, regathering, uh, and to, to hold the tension of that. So, so, so there's that, and, and how to find refuge in that loss if there is such a thing. And I guess you know, David, I, I and, and Billy Ray, I guess I, I thought of that line when you were talking about whether or not refuge can be a safe place, in part because I think Billy Ray in those lines. For me, like I thought, I, I, the part of what's happening in those lines is pointing us to the tension, the deep tension in, um, you know, security or safety on the one hand, and a dullness, which is its own kind of danger. And anyone who has been um, under stay-at-home orders for any period of time, and I know all of you out there have been, <laughs> you know, you'll know, you'll recall that feeling of dulling. You know, I think that there was a way in which the world not didn't just get smaller, it lost some kind of color, you know, like at first it was sort of cozy and then it became something else, you know, and I, so I, I don't know if you want to add to any of that or think about that at, at this point, Dilly Ray. But. Mm. I'll, I'll say that I wrote that poem, it's from a larger poem called Red Utopia. Oh, so my yeah, interest yeah. in thinking about the ways that indigenous peoples bear a trace of the utopian that colonialism and colonial violence attempt to crush. Yeah. But I was also thinking about the, the small worlds that we build for ourselves as to gesture to the title coping mechanisms. Um, because to quote, uh, Lauren Berlant, who we also lost during the pandemic, uh, they have this phrase, the, the too closeness of the world. So we all want a world, but we can't bear it, partly because we can't bear it alone. And so, you know, we have to be in a relationship with others and by extension, with the world, which means that we have to confront the ways that we can, even in our own communities, uh, brutalize one another. So that line about, you know, ghost and a machine of relationality, I was thinking about the ways that, you know, queer indigenous people, two-spirit people, uh, trans indigenous people, how sort of, you know, to very humbly borrow Sadia Hartman's phrase, you know, have been pushed into the, the position of the unthought uh, in this larger indigenous uh, social struggle mm -hmm. and that, you know, we can't actually achieve something like decolonization if we also uh, sort of neglect that community. That 
just illuminates a whole world for me there. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think, I, I guess, you know, when you're talking about that, I, I do think a lot about how you wrote about the experience of aloneness in a minor course, mm -hmm. um, the experience of the apartment um, with the two bedrooms and you and a, and some very little furniture <laughs> like that you described, and the ways in which you navigated what it meant to inhabit aloneness in this space, your expectation that you would have a room, or not you, sorry, I'm so sorry, I did that literary thing that I told my students not to do. The <laughs> character, the character, the protagonist <laughs> in a minor course, um, uh, you know, navigates the, both the desire for a roommate and the desire to not have that yeah. person in that space. And, uh, and, and the delicacy of, feeling both invaded and not and and wanting in that moment uh and so i i wonder you know if you th when you when you th were r crafting a minor course and i know you know it was something you've been working on for a long time part of what i was thinking about was also how and and forgive the massive leap here <laughs> but i'm just going to do it um form and genre is itself a kind of room uh and i was thinking a lot about what it meant for you to move to a novel um, from poetry, from nonfiction, and to think about how inhabiting the novel as a space of both togetherness and aloneness mm -hmm. is different than the room of poetry, if you will. So mm -hmm. forgive the metaphor, but I, I don't know if that was something you might want to think with me about, but I thought a lot about it because I was like, it's a novel. <laughs> and and, I, was, uh, and it, I just felt a bit old fashioned about that, but <laughs> it really struck me yeah. um, the way, what you do with form there. Mm -hmm. I'll say that most of my uh, trepidations or anxieties around the novel had to do with inhabiting such a vast history. Mm -hmm. I was also keenly aware of the way that in the West, at least, we received the novel uh, sort of by way of colonial and imperial transit. And so I had to figure out a way to, to inhabit that space without reproducing these other terrible logics. So that the fetish of the individual or um, uh, the various kinds of conquests that novelists can make ordinary people desire. <laughs> And yeah. so uh, how, partly how I did that was by imbuing my protagonist with um, my own emotional texture, because there are so few books by queer indigenous people and even fewer novels by queer indigenous people. And so I wanted to claim this other kind of space for novelistic writing that uh, one could be a queer indigenous person writing a queer indigenous novel and, in, and insist, insist on our capacity to be free and to desire freedom. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I'm just going to hold that and the desire for freedom because I, when you, so I don't, you and I both read a minor course recently, I think. And so I was just thinking a lot about, I, I reread Brother in conjunction with a minor course. So it was, for me, it was very interesting to have these two texts with each other. And, you know, in, in a minor course, there's so much navigating of open space as well. Um, Billy and Ray and I were making a little bit of a joke about thinking about a minor course as a road, road narrative <laughs> in a kind of slightly, um, complicated way <laughs> uh, earlier, but I was also thinking, David, about brother and about how you rescript the idea of the Canadian wild or the landscape um, in brother in the writing that you have done about the Rouge Valley in brother. And if you'll forgive me, I think we have time. I'm going to actually read a longer, pa a bit of a passage for you of your own book. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's weird. But I'm going to do it anyway um, because I, I just. I don't know, just as somebody who trained in some ways in Canadian literature, what I was so struck by 
in, in the way you write about the Rouge and Brother is how you take, I, I, I don't know if this is what you meant to do, but for me, you took a lot of what we might think of as conventional Canadiana, um, but you, you turned it a little bit. And, and, I, and so um, this is about, well, you'll know. You know your book better than I do. But <laughs> this is past the halfway mark. Um, you're, you're writing, you write of the Rouge. We'd spend whole seasons down there. The falls when the valley floor was a bowl of yellow and orange and red. The winters when the trees were bare. The ice locking up the creek. Our breath on the stillest days like the purest calcium in the air before us. The summers when the creek shrank and the gooseberries along the side of the path broke at the slightest touch. Insects bumbling about, heavy and tired, with pollen and nectar. And that magic spring, I still remember it, when the creek rushed fast, extra fast, and high with the winter melts. When there was everywhere the fluff of some plant in the air, white spores, millions of them, each of them a memory, a dream, waiting to land and bloom. And I remember when I read this passage again, I saw so clearly, and partly because I, I was very, I had the great luck to, to see Brother at TIFF, um, also the way this, the valley is uh, uh, depicted in Clement Virgo's, through Clement Virgo's brilliant lens. And I thought a lot about this passage and how it pulls, you know, from these traditions of the pastoral or the bucolic, but it's not that, you know, it's that and not that. And I love, I love that. I love how it is that and not that. Uh, and so even though the Rouge is not home exactly, it, you know, it is also a shelter and a refuge in a different way. And I wondered if you were recalibrating in some ways the idea of the Canadian landscape as a kind of refuge or shelter um, in how you, how you tell, how you, how you just, narrate the Rouge Valley for us? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, especially with that last image of the spores, um, uh, you know, um, it is a, um, you know, it's my effort to, to write of a diasporic attention to land that will never be, never was and never will be uh, the boy's own or the family's own. Uh, how do we authentically see and appreciate um, a land without imagining that we own it, uh, without the, the foolishness of a claim that, that is never ours to have? And so in a, in a way, even though I'm trying to stay in the consciousness and voice of the, the characters in, in the book, I'm, um, you know, what would a black decolonial approach to um, to land B, yeah. and it's, this is my this is my effort. Now, of course, so, you know, because I move through language, because I move through the novel form, because I move through, as you say, the the tropes of of uh, of, uh, uh, of how landscapes are evoked. I, there is that baggage, but I'm interested in how these characters, and by extension, myself, how we are um, pushing through. Yeah. Um, these these scripts, these these oftentimes so awful scripts of belonging, um, uh, and uh, in in so doing, I guess um, um, you know, attempting to represent uh, um, an, an openness to a different understanding about the land that exceeds. What the boys are able to, uh, what the boys are able to enunciate or feel or into it, or whatnot. There is this one. I'll just really quickly. There is this one. Um, um, once the mother takes the boys down into the rouge and um, and is trying to provide them with a sense of of ordinary joy in the midst of fear and. Um, and she says, you know, look around, look at, look at the beauty around you. Um, look, at those, look at those creatures flying there. If you look at them, you might imagine that they're little bits of paper that have been just tossed in the wind and scattered nowhere, an alphabet of, of nothingness. Um, but look closely, they're living things and they're, they're flying. 
And that again is an effort to um, represent in a careful attention to the space around them a, um, a diasporic experience of vulnerability um, and, it, and also of, uh, of care, of, of, um, of um, yeah, yeah, maybe that's it. I'm so glad you brought that up because the other thing, well, I'm thinking of so many things, but the other thing I was thinking a lot about when I you know, had, had the great homework assignment of rereading all your work and for, you know, for, to prepare to talk to you tonight was I was thinking a lot about how both of you, I think, just show so much tenderness and vulnerability for the people in your books, people and characters in your books. And I, I, I think it's so rare to have this kind of care uh, for all, all of the people, the characters that we will encounter as readers in the texts that you write, nonfiction, poetry, um, novel, you know, across all the genre. I think you, you both have this, I, I think, gift of, of bringing tenderness and vulnerability to, to the people we will meet um, as readers. And I wondered, uh, and maybe Billy Ray, I'll start with you. If, if there's a, a sense in which your books are or could be a kind of refuge or shelter for the people and the characters that you inhabit or live with when you write. Mm -hmm. See that I've begun to think that the novel asked me to confront how I was living because I had to write or I had to in, invent characters that wanted to be alive. And I had to afford them the dignity of that desire without letting, you know, whatever baggage I carry cloud that. Yeah. And you know, that's an immense task <laughs> and one that I did not know I was in for. <laughs> And uh, the, none of the characters in the novel are real people. But I knew that I had to write about them as though they were. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, be as honest as possible about what people who live in Northern Alberta endure simply because that's where they're born or that's their ancestral territory. And also because Northern Alberta is where so much of the structural antagonisms of colonialism rear their head in a way and end in a way that does not receive ethical attention. Yeah. So I hope that the characters in the novel um, do reach out to the reader for understanding, for forgiveness, but also to, again, co-produce hope. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, I thank you, and I, I, I think we are all, hopefully, thank you for inviting us to co-produce with you you know, this, this, the possibility of hope and hope mm -hmm. itself. And, and David, I don't, I don't know if you want to, also talk a bit about the kind of shelter that you your characters might have or find or any of that i mean it's hard because i'm actually i'm i'm you know studying uh <laughs> billy ray's response which you know for me moved so powerfully from the practice of writing and those those moments when uh the work itself calls you into a type of a new type of relationship it's not a not an inert project it's it's something different, um, and and that. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, um, what is the what is the form of what is the space that a book provides? What is the space that literature provides? Um, you know, it's. Uh, I love the idea of of co-produced hope. Um, uh, because in the act of reading, uh, you're, you're doing precisely that. Um, you know, I, and I, I, I 
strongly spec Billy Ray as well. Uh, we're we're thinking of particular, you know, communities when we write our books, and those are so um, those are you know those are everything. Those are so central to 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 what we're doing. Um, um, Yeah, and that's 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 the hope. If we can uh, if we can offer whatever that whatever the space of literature does um, to those to those uh, those beloved members of of our communities and and others, whoever whoever is willing to 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 read. I'm just speaking about who I'm thinking about when I'm writing. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, what a what a um, what an honor that would be. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I realize now that this, I told you guys this would go fast <laughs> and the time is going extremely fast. And I want to, uh, we, I want to open up the, the floor to those of you who are here with us who might have questions for Billy Ray and for David. Um, please raise your hand if you want. The lights are quite bright. So I'm going to have to do that thing where I shield my eyes to see you. Um, we also have some questions from our audience that were submitted in advance. Uh, so I can start with some of those, but I'm, let's just take a beat. And also, I also want to say thank you both for being such good sports. I gave them almost no notes and no prep. <laughs> and look, they're so brilliant. So, <laughs> so thank you both for rolling with me on this. Um, does anybody have, a bur uh, have something they want to ask now? Sorry, as I, and you know, as a professor, I'm very comfortable with these silences. <laughs> yes, hi. <laughs> Please go ahead. Do we need to mic the questions? I'm sorry, I forgot to ask. Oh yes. Is oh, so we're inviting, there? if, could you please, there's a mic right behind you in the, right there, would you mind? Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Testing, t I was just about to say I have a big voice, but <laughs> I have to do it here. Uh, great to be here. I just wanted to ask David a quick question. Um, we had the pleasure of reading Brother in one of our classes uh, last year, and uh, I hadn't read the novel before, but uh, I just want to let you know, uh, it really changed my life. It was really a great essay for us immigrant children new to the country, trying to find our space. And I just happened to have it on my coffee table. My mother came by and I didn't know she started reading it. And uh, within half an hour, she had tears in her eyes because she hadn't read anything like this. So I just wanted to thank you on behalf of our family for such a powerful uh, novel. And I just really was fascinated by the fact that it was turned into a film. So I haven't seen the film yet, so I just wanted to hear from you. What was that like, the end-to-end -end process? Were you happy with the final project? I, plan I do plan to see it soon. And uh, I just always think that's such a fascinating journey uh, to go from, um, literary work to cinematic work. So just want to know what was that like for you, the author? Oh, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so honored uh, by what you just said. And, uh, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the greatest honor, uh, you know, a writer can have when, when there's a, a appreciation for their, for their work. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Um, 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 yeah, yeah, I, I had no involvement in the the shift from the book to the film, I, I um, decided that I I, um, I didn't uh, I, I decided that maybe what I'm what I might be you know better at is writing, not not thinking about what goes into a film, <laughs> and um, and you know I might be might have been very right about that, but I you know the the director and filmmaker was this, it was uh, is a extremely kind of prominent and celebrated Black Canadian filmmaker Clement Virgo, and um, and I've known his work for decades, you know, decades, and uh, and admired his work for decades, and so I felt very comfortable letting him do it. And um, yeah, I I think it's I think it's an extraordinary achievement. You know, a book is a book, and a film is a film, and so there, you know, it's you know the the mediums in which we tell stories and represent things um, necessarily changes changes the story. Let's call it. Um, but um, but yeah, I'm really I'm I'm uh, I, I I'm just so struck, and again I'm honored, you know, that 
that that somehow I didn't think it could turn into a film. I, it's like a, such a non-linear, <laughs> weird novel. You know, it, what, why did it turn that into a film? Is uh, it was a huge question in my mind. But um, yeah, but thank you again. Yay! Thank you, thank you for your question. Ah, please. <laughs> Are you going to invite you? Yes, thank you. For, there's a mic over on the edge there. Thank you. Um, one of my favorite things to do at events is participate, and especially in class. So I was here to do just that. Yay. Just kidding. <laughs> I was actually here um, to listen to engage and to feel a part of. So what I wanted to ask was, as a, as a person, as a student, as a human being, I always feel apart from, right? I always feel like I don't fit in or I'm not good enough or whatever, right? That, that there's not a connection. And I just wanted to know, like, cause I, I, I was able to speak with both of you earlier, right? And you are both beautiful human beings who made me feel like I belonged. And I just wanted to let you know that it's people like you who give people like me a space of refuge to feel like I'm not alone. And if there is anything that you do, like it was natural. It wasn't forced, it wasn't uncomfortable, it was just natural. And I just, it's so hard to find connection I find because I'm a weirdo. <laughs> um, so I just, like how how do you just do that? Like how do you how do you go from being not known to being known and, and, and people coming up to you and asking for your autograph and just being like, you know, that person that people look up to. How do you do that, I guess? I don't know if that's too much of an existential question. I'm so sorry <laughs> about this. But, you know, I just I really appreciate both of you and I wanted you to know that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I wish to clap for all of your question too. Uh, but, but Billy Ray, would you like to, to start with? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I th I'm thinking back to when I was not known and that it you know, did not, did not matter that I was not known in the literary or public sense, but what mattered was that um, I felt that the work that I was doing both in a literary sense, but also in a sort of social justice sense was plugged into this larger collective undertaking of imagining the world differently so that you know we can connect and so that we aren't severed from one another. And um, another thought is about becoming a writer and I always say that so I first started publishing my poems on a blog that I that I built which is probably something that all editors would tell emerging writers not to do <laughs> uh, but I had no idea what you know Canadian literature was or what the publishing industry did and so I built this blog for myself and I put my poems there and I would share them on Facebook and my community, both in Northern Alberta, but of, of colleagues and friends in Edmonton, you know, celebrated those poems. And so they, they claimed me as a poet before I was able to do that for myself, until I was able to do that for myself. And so I think there's something there about, um, the, the sort of generosity of others to, to see us even when we can't see ourselves. But yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. David? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Billy Ray has said it so <laughs> once again, so, so brilliantly, I think. Yeah. I, know, like I, I, can only, I can only thank you for what you said. They, yes, yeah. thank, thank you. And thank you, Billy Ray. And yeah, yeah. I, I'm with you. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for that beautiful question, thank for you. both of our beautiful questions. Are there any other questions out there that anybody would like to ask? Yes, please come on up to the mic.
Hello. Um, this is weird talking to a room full of people again, um, <laughs> but thank you for uh, hosting this event. I found what you were saying about being alone um, very relatable, and I feel like a lot of us here probably felt that. Um, but my question is uh, to whoever would like to answer, and I wrote it down because I get very nervous talking in front of people, so I will also ramble. Um, I was uh, just posing more of an existential question, I guess, of, um, oh my gosh, I'm so messy. Uh, how do we achieve the feeling of together when we're not sure what a community needs or how to be a part of a community that you're not yet integrated into? I feel like that's quite a big question for today's society when everything is maybe online or not accessible in the way that it used to be. And do you feel that in doing so, it promotes a sense of unity or a sense of aloneness if you can't achieve what you're trying to achieve? That is a beautiful question. And in fact, I'm going to ask you to repeat it again because it had so much in it. It was so rich. So okay. do you mind? Uh, I'm sorry. I was, I was like, my I thesis hear is that writing again. itself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so basically, my question is, um, in the time where we haven't had access to culture and community, how do you curate a genuine and meaningful culture when you're not sure what the community's needs are or what your needs as a writer are to achieve like in your work? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Why don't I start with you, David? Yeah, I mean, I f you know, it's, it's a great question. I, I, feel it's, I feel it's beyond me in a lot of ways, but the, um, you know, the, the, it was what you uh, read, that you, I think it was modified when you repeated it the second time, but, but the, the, the words you read the first time, if I, if I recall, and I could be, I could, you know, you, how can we imagine a community when we don't know what that community is? Mm -hmm. And how can we belong to a community when we're not fully integrated into that community? Um, yeah. In a strange way, I see those as amazing moments of opportunity. Um, dare we dream of communities, uh, you know, uh, beyond, you know, the, the, um, what we have assumed about how our communities must be structured, uh, beyond the institutions that mediate our lives, and oftentimes in, in, in negative ways, sometimes, sometimes violent ways. Um, um, what if we thought about community rather than the presumption of, of, rather than presuming um, what is beneficial in, in, in integration, uh, uh, what if we thought of community in more radical ways, uh, a community of, of, of free people, uh, radically free, um, able to then, um, you know, hear and see what, in your second second part of your question, what 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 others need, or what we need, um, that's that's how I'd maybe begin trying to answer that question. But I, it's you know, it's funny that you know I think you had the it, what excited me, you know the very words that you used in the in in the question, um, but not as problems, uh, rather as a as a as a crisis in terms of an opportunity. Thank you so much. So great. Do you want do you want to jump in on this? Or? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how I can <laughs> um, <laughs> jump in. There. You don't have to. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to. But yeah, I'll just say that I'm just thinking of like the non-conventional ways that we build community. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. unknowingly. Yeah. Like I think of how much, how intensely I read whatever queer literature I could find when I was, you know, a teenager, in incredibly closeted, and uh, how, how that created some, a kind of abstract community that nonetheless still felt real enough. Um, but also, uh, I'm also thinking of the desire to make something beautiful, or to make something that feels real already puts you in relation to others who mm -hmm. share that desire. Mm -hmm. 
And so I, I keep saying this, <laughs> which is that you know, the pandemic, especially sort of the early waves of it, asked us to show up for each other in ways that didn't mean immediate proximity. Yeah. I think, yeah. you know, we should carry that on because we can't always be together. Yeah. That's why we're lonely, yeah. but you know, we can still show up for each other. Yeah. I love that. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. I, I, I see we have a question at the mic, and I'm going to offer you the last question in person. And then we, we had actually a number of amazing questions um, from our virtual audience. So I'm going to close with one of the uh, virtual questions as well. But please, I, I invite you now to ask your question. Hello. Uh, Hi. Uh, my question is, so everybody wants to belong, but what if what makes one person belong makes another person feel like they don't belong. How do you deal with that problem? That's a real contradiction. Yeah. I think yes. that's, the, that's the contradiction that we open yeah. the yeah. conversation with. I think that's it. I think it's a, I think it's a great question. I, 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 I personally feel that it's the way it works. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, we, we deserve, we deserve safety. We deserve to, our needs to be met. We, we deserve love and beauty and these, these things. Um, I guess it's just, I, I don't know. It, it seems to me, and again, it's just, it's a particular perspective, maybe drawing from particular sources that, um, that there is a legacy of, you know, um, of belonging, um, that comes from out of, um, you know, per, you know, I, I would say a form of, um, you know, it's the history of the nation state. It's the history of race. It's the history of, you know, specific notions of ethnicity. Those are, those are caustic, violent notions of belonging and they necessarily meant that someone else didn't belong. They were necessarily exclusionary. Um, and so, um, I think I think your question names 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 the problem, um, except that um, you know when we you know am I so am I so flippant to say oh I I don't need to belong of course I I, I think I do I, and I I do feel a sense of belonging and kinship with with people and that has sustained me. But I guess it's just the it's the question of form maybe maybe as as writers we're we're trying to think. You know, and that's really the the best. You know, if if I have things of value to say, it's it's usually not on the great grand qu um, questions afflicting humanity. It's mm -hmm. um, I think it's out of a certain specific practice that I maybe I I offer my voice and I, with the hope that others <laughs> others <laughs> with different types of knowledge, uh, you know, deeper knowledge in many different areas uh, theirs. But I think it's yeah, I think it's the um, it's a question of form. How, how do we belong? Um, um, yeah. Thank you. Would you like to add to <laughs> David's amazing response? <laughs> I mean, I think I I think I'll just add that we also have to reserve th the right to establish boundaries. I think that's like an enduring feminist lesson yeah. is that um, self-preservation matters and that sort of we can preserve ourselves so that we can show up for our communities and hold our communities accountable. That's so, that's so, I, yeah, that's, uh, I've, I'm sorry to interject, but that, that yeah, resonates, yeah. <laughs> you know, so much with so many people I know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's true. I, I, my dream was to see you two talk to each other. So this was great. Interject away. <laughs> um, but I, I, I know that we're a little bit over time. Thank you to the, for the audience. But I do want to give a shout out to all of the amazing virtual participants who have also submitted questions. And I, I, I think actually we, we to, to all of you out there virtual, I, I actually think the conversation responded to many of the things that you've asked in your virtual submissions. But I do, I want to close just with a, um, a question about writing and, 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 
how, so the question is from um, Parker Johnson. And, uh, and, and Parker wants to know, you know, how has your writing changed over time? What do you love to read? And I think this is a thing that everybody asks all writers. <laughs> and so, but, but no, no, I shouldn't say it that way. But, but what I, what I'm interested in your answer because I want to know what I should go home and add to my list. So, um, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> and, and something for all of you, but, uh, no. David, David, do you want to start? Like, sure. you know, uh, okay. Uh, okay, if it's Parker Johnson from Vancouver, hi, Parker. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> such a, you know, a great, great, uh, amazing thinker and activist uh, in the black community in Vancouver. Yeah. If it's the same person, you know, maybe it's not. Um, um, well, you know, I, I unlike, I hope, like, unlike maybe students at York now, um, you know, I... I didn't read any work by a writer of color until I was third year university. Um, the only reason I did was because, not because a university syllabus offered it, but because I hung out with you know, black students in the, in the student center and we talked, uh, you know, there were names thrown out. And I was like, oh yeah, we think we've heard of someone named James Baldwin. And I was in a library and I saw the price of the ticket, Baldwin's collected essays on a shelf. I pulled it off and pulled the book down and and literally stood there and then sat down in the aisle reading, reading this book. And um, so my, in terms of that question, my, my, um, I've, I've discovered books that, um, you know, reading, sometimes I, I want to, to encounter um, this, the, the luminous otherness of, of someone else's experience. I, I you know, I, I, um, I want to learn from from a different experience. That's that's a wonderful way of reading for me. Um, a different way of thinking about the world, different way of representing the world, different ways of feeling, um, and 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 thinking about the good. But um, I also have um, been able to read books for for I guess for, for decades now. If I'm getting <laughs> a little older now. Um, that are you know you know, uh, written by Caribbean authors, written by black authors, written by, um, you know, diasporic authors around the world. And uh, not to mention, uh, you know, what's exerted, you know, tremendously powerful uh, influence, uh, kind of, not influence, but um, um, has taught me so much and, and taught me a, a posture of, of appreciation and also humility in indigenous authors. Um, th that's been crucial for me. Um, I can't imagine being a writer if I didn't read these authors and if I didn't engage with these authors in, in different ways. If I, if I, um, and so that's, that's one of the major ways that, uh, that, that uh, my reading, what I've been reading has uh, shifted. But you know, I maintain, I, you know, I read widely, you know, uh, and, you know, read something by, by Billy Ray, you know, Billy Ray reads extraordinarily widely um, uh, as well. And I think that's a great thing for, for writers to, to do. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll answer similarly <laughs> and say that uh, in my undergrad, I took a class that I probably changed my reading life which was a class called Women in World Literature. If you get a chance to take a class like that, I think you should. We read women, uh, mostly women of color in translation. We also read Toni Morrison in that class, read Beloved, and it was sort of this like beautiful and terrible experience um, that you know, I, I think is part of the reason that we read and then also we're moved enough to write. Um, and in terms of the question about how my um, writing has changed over time, you know, I'm um, I've written I've written four books, but they're they're slim volumes. <laughs> I'll put it that way. <laughs> Save this volume. <laughs> um, so, uh, but what I've noticed is that you know I'm returning to some of these questions that I thought I had moved on from. So I'm working on some poems now. Uh, about my childhood. And I thought I had been done with the question of my childhood, uh, but it turns out I'm not. <laughs> and I, and I, I, I think it's because, 
yeah, there's such specificity to a native childhood, to an, an indigenous childhood, that that you know, is subtextually a part of a lot of national conversations, but so rarely explicitly. And so, so that's where, where I'm at these days. I can't wait to read where you are at now <laughs> in, in some wonderful, like for years. beautiful future <laughs> where I will drag you. No, I, thank you. I want to thank you both. I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn now to my closing remarks, but I want to, before I do that, there's going to be two opportunities to clap, and one of them is now <laughs> because I just feel so amazing. Thank you so thank you. much. So amazing. Uh, and now I'll move to my formal closing remarks. <laughs> Sorry, I just felt like clapping, so I wanted to invite you all to clap. <laughs> but I wanted to thank, thank everyone for being here tonight, in person and virtually, and especially to our panelists, Billy Ray and David. Thank you for your generosity, for your brilliance, for your patience, and for the care that you've given to speaking and talking and being in genuine dialogue with each other, with me, and with all of you. I would also like to express my thanks to our communications, event team, and virtual teams, LTS, led by the amazing Grant McNair. We couldn't have done this without you. I know I wanted to clap too, but hold it, because we're going to invite you to do it right at the end. Because there's so many people who we can't see who made this happen, and we, but we see you, and we know you're doing amazing work. Thank you. Uh, to Dell and Juanita Smith for their generous support in highlighting and championing the theme of peace, justice, and human security for all, and for their brilliance, actually, in understanding that we need to talk, really talk, when we want to learn. And so I think that they're, 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 they're understanding that dialogues are our way into so much of what we want to know. Thank you all for coming. We hope to see you next year at the next Smith Dialogues event. And this is your second time to clap. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.